It wasn't too long ago that social media hadn't yet permeated just about every corner of our society, when the equivalent of Instagram famous then was bragging to a few of your buddies about your new car or that pretty girl you just met. And you were instantly verified when you pulled out that picture from your wallet of that car and you holding that girl. And you felt good when your buddies congratulated you and some even gave you a thumbs up. It's called the same thing now as it was then bragging and there's a lot of baggage that came with it if you weren't actually about it like the insecurities of jealousy which brings about the intricacies of lying and then comes the realization of reality and for some the denial of it as the youngins would come to call it today fake flexing in 2004 one man did the unthinkable to keep his flex going Welcome to Monkey Tales, intriguing true stories wherever we can find them, told by me, the left-handed monkey. If your idea of a good time is a good true crime, then subscribe, or you're gonna regret it. Allow me to take you guys back to 2004, Del Mar, New York. Now this is Peter, now he's gonna wake up on this cold November morning next to his wife of the past 30 years, the lovely Joan. Now before we move ahead, let me go ahead and introduce you guys to the cast of characters we have here. So we've met Peter, now he is a retiring lawyer who's ending his legal career as an appellate court clerk and his wife is Joan who is a speech pathologist four children. Now, they weren't rich by any means, but they did have a nice house, two stories, they lived comfortably, they had nothing to complain about, and they were able to raise two fine sons. Their oldest is a 23-year-old named Jonathan. Now, he is a lieutenant in the U.S. Navy. And their 21-year-old, Christopher, he was attending the prestigious University of Rochester, so everything was hunky-dory. Okay, let's go ahead and go back to when Peter wakes up. So Peter gets up, it's cold, he puts on a sweater and starts walking to the bathroom as he has done every morning for the past Lord knows how long, right? But today something feels different, okay? Now, once he's standing in front of the mirror, he just feels a bit more fatigued maybe. Well, whatever it was, it caused him to just take a seat on the toilet and reflect for a moment. I mean, he was 52 now, so probably he had to... Maybe exercise a bit more, eat a bit healthier, you know, take it easy. So he slowly gets up and he starts to make his way downstairs. Now, once he's downstairs, he notices that a few dishes are not done. So he takes those dishes and puts them in the dishwasher and he goes to the fridge and starts gathering food to make himself some breakfast and also to pack himself a lunch for work that day. But of course, he can never eat his breakfast without the newspaper. So he starts walking down the hall to the front door to go ahead and go get it. But here, he just starts to feel that, that fatigue again. So he's, he has to lean against the wall. And as he's walking, he's just, just leaning and leaning. And he just doesn't know what's wrong, right? But he is able to make it to the door and get his newspaper and once he was outside definitely something was off about himself today because he had just locked himself out of the house so but that that was no issue because he had hidden keys under the plant so he grabs it lets himself back in and he starts making his way back down the hall back to the kitchen now <clears throat> this is when his body pretty much lost as much blood as it could withstand and he falls to the floor and he dies so since we have the luxury of hindsight let's go ahead and leave Peter's body right here and walk back up those stairs and check up on Joan so once we're back in the master bedroom the first thing we see is a bloody axe at the foot of the bed. Now, Joan looks like she's just sound asleep, but if we were to walk even closer, we could see that she's actually lying in her own pool of blood. And if we were to even get closer, we could actually hear the faintest breath. We could actually feel the slightest pulse. Now, Joan herself knew that she had to stay alive because she saw who did it? 
So when Peter didn't show up at the court for work the next morning, people were concerned because he was just not that irresponsible as not to call in if he was sick or if something was wrong. So they sent a court officer over to the house. And what that court officer would see when he drove up was already suspicious. The door was ajar and there was a key in the door. Okay, now he was going to go ahead and poke his head in and see what was inside. And I'm pretty sure he wished he hadn't. Because once he looked inside, it looked like somebody was just painting the walls with blood. That was when Peter was walking to get that newspaper and just leaning up against every single wall, just leaving blood smears everywhere. And then he looked down that hall and he saw on the floor the body of his friend, Peter. 911, what's the location of the emergency? Broccoli Drive, Delmar, New York. Okay. Broccoli? Yes. Hey, what's the problem? There is a, a 55-year-old white male down on the ground. We have a court officer on the scene. 55-year-old male? Yes. An armed court officer on the scene. He's on the scene? Yes. Okay. The guy did not show up for work today. He's... He's unresponsive? He's unresponsive. There's, you, you don't know. You, he's unresponsive. You, you don't know if there's any breathing, anything, do you? Checking his pulse right now. We're trying to see if there's a pulse. Okay. Keep with me on that. It's a crime scene. It's a crime scene? It's a crime scene is what I'm being told by the officer on the scene. Okay. So when detectives worked the scene, they were able to rule out robbery right off the bat because they were just seasoned enough to know a staged scene when they saw one. I mean, there was a few drawers pulled out. There was a few things disheveled. There was nothing major missing. And there was even a cut screen window and no one could even fit through that window. So, you know, so they ruled that out. Okay. So what they believe happened was that somebody let themselves in the front door using that that secret key under the plants that Peter used that morning and went straight to the alarm and disarmed it with the master code and then would go ahead and go to the garage where there was a known axe as according to family members an axe in the garage they took that axe and just went straight to the master bedroom where Peter and Joan were asleep now the intruder would walk right up to Joan stand right next to her and raise that axe Peter was struck 16 times with the axe, severely damaging his brain's neocortex, which dictates most of our cognitive functions. So that morning, he was strictly acting on simple, primal instincts, such as his morning routine. Joan had also taken three strikes from the same axe, causing severe head trauma. The axe is left at the foot of the bed, and the attacker flees but not before cutting the phone wires outside the house. So now detectives had to establish a motive. Now, the most concerning thing, of course, was the ability to disarm that alarm with the master code. But something else that raised their hairs was the fact that the killer was definitely there to kill Peter and Joan, but they didn't feel a need to bring their own weapon because they went to the garage to grab that axe. So that axe they knew was waiting for them there right so surely this sounded like somebody they knew now could it be one of their sons maybe it was both of their sons so would they be cold-blooded enough to do this and why and upon further digging well detectives did find 1.1 million reasons why one of the sons would want to do this Jonathan, the Navy lieutenant, was serving on a nuclear submarine at the time, hundreds of miles away. His alibi was solid. Christopher, who was 220 miles away himself, said that he was asleep in his dorm lounge. They searched his Jeep. It showed no signs of blood or any forensic leads. And then a mysterious letter arrives for detectives, taunting them about botching the case and looking at the wrong guy. The sender would take claim for the killing, saying that he brought his own little axe to murder Peter, and Joan, well, she was just collateral damage who sadly survived. A very crude letter, and the sender was never identified. Then there was a death threat they uncovered against Peter and a judge from a man who lost custody of his children. 
but that too turned into a dead end when the man had an airtight alibi. And then they learned of a mob tie that Peter had. One of his family members, named Frankie, was in an organized crime syndicate, currently in a federal prison for loan sharking. There was a rumor that he turned state's evidence for a reduced sentence, so the mob put a hit out on Peter to send Frankie a message about snitching. This didn't bear much fruit as Frankie is still in jail because he never did cooperate with the law. So police were running out of leads. The public was getting restless because they believed a killer was on a loose in their neighborhood. And then the murmurs of a botched investigation started to make its round. So police really had to sit down and take a fresh look at the case. Now, remember when I told you guys about Joan taking that slight breath? Well, here's where it comes into play. So Joan was actually put into an ambulance and a detective jumped into that ambulance and started asking Joan questions immediately. He asked, did a family member do this to you? And to everybody's surprise that was in that ambulance, she nodded, yes. He quickly asked, did Jonathan do this to you? She actually shook no. Did Chris do this to you? And she nodded, yes. Now let's get into the timeline for that night. A yellow jeep is seen leaving Chris's university campus at 10.30 p.m. Chris drives a yellow jeep. Identifying traits about the jeep are seen on camera, a mud splash pattern on the passenger side, along with a torn parking sticker, and a political sticker on the back tire cover that reads W2004. It matched Chris's jeep exactly. The alarm to the house is disarmed at 2.14 a.m., just a little over three and a half hours from when that Jeep leaves campus. Fun fact, Rochester to Del Mar, New York takes a little over three and a half hours to reach. But the only problem here is, in order to make that time, you needed to use the tollways. Chris's toll tag was clean, and there was no indication that his Jeep was on the highway that night. Back to the timeline. The phone line is cut at 4.59 a.m. according to the phone company's record and the same yellow Jeep returns back to campus at 8.30 a.m. just a little over three and a half hours again. And then the cracks started to show in Chris's alibi. If you guys remember, he said that he was sleeping in the dorm lounge that night. His own frat brothers would not back his story. They said that they were in the dorm lounge that night watching Shrek 2. And Chris, he definitely was not there. And then there was this other issue. A neighbor saw his yellow Jeep parked in his parents' driveway at 4 a.m. in the morning. And he's positive that that's Chris's Jeep because he sees that Jeep all the time. So as detectives were interviewing his frat brothers, a motive started to materialize right before their eyes because they were telling detectives that Chris was always bragging about being a rich boy and that he was expecting to inherit more shortly that he was spending so liberally. He was buying people things. He was just making sure everybody liked him. He was even bankrolling entire parties for them. So we all know that Peter and Joan, they did do good in life, but they weren't rich by any means to support such a lifestyle that Chris was living. So what was Chris doing to get these funds? Well, of course, detectives dug a little deeper and there they found it forged document loans to the tune of about $31,000 and that nifty yellow Jeep he's been just driving around in. Well, he forged his dad's signature to buy that too. Peter and Joan would be made aware of this eventually, of course, by the creditors. And upon further digging, detectives found the emails that Peter was sending to Chris, multiple angry emails that started with, what the hell are you doing? And basically ended with, we'll talk more about this when you come home for Thanksgiving. And Peter was known to have told his coworkers that he actually thought that his son Chris was a sociopath. But th it was this next tidbit that detectives learned that actually made things just crystal clear, made the narrative come together. And that was, Chris was failing every class. He was failing 
out of the University of Rochester. Now, the pressures that were building at this point because no more money was coming in for him. He was exposed for the 31K fraud. He was exposed for buying a Jeep with his dad's credit. And so his back was against the wall, okay? And he had become accustomed to this certain type of life, this certain type of, you know, facade. So he didn't want to lose that. So his only out was the fact that he knew that his parents had life insurance. Now, you got to think about it this way, okay? He'd rather kill his parents. These parents probably would have given him everything they wanted. They loved him. And they probably did give him everything he wanted because obviously he turned out to be a spoiled little shit. But he would rather trade in those parents for the adoration of his frat brothers. These are the same frat brothers that didn't even back his alibi that night. That is not a good trade. And even his older brother, Jonathan, didn't say much about him, didn't even vouch for him. All he said was that their relationship was strained. Okay, well, everything I've told you thus far, it could be made circumstantial by any defense lawyer that is worth their weight. So what the prosecutors had to do at this point was put Chris inside that Jeep physically, without a doubt. Going over photos of the initial search of Chris's Jeep, they noticed that the toll tag was disconnected and on the floorboards. To detectives, there was only one reason he would choose to do that. So how did he get through the tolls? It had to be what the toll booths called the throughway, where you would pay cash instead. But unfortunately, these were not equipped with surveillance. So they had to find and talk with the throughway toll collectors that night. And they did recall a yellow Jeep going through but would not be able to identify who was driving. Detectives had to start thinking outside the box but were also going to have to get a bit lucky. How the tollways worked in New York was once you paid the fare, you are given a throughway ticket that you could redeem on your way back. They gathered all the throughway tickets, which only amounted to 12 tickets that night, so Lady Luck was on their side, but they were going to need her full cooperation for the next step, that Christopher transferred some skin cells on any of those tickets. Maybe murdering his parents made his hands a bit sweaty. Maybe he was rubbing the tickets for fun. So when the results finally came back, one of the tickets had Chris's DNA on it. They scientifically placed Chris in that yellow Jeep that night. They charged Christopher Porco with the murder of his father, Peter Porco, and the attempted murder of his mother, Joan Porco. Even though Joan had indicated with a nod that her son Chris had done it, she was now convinced that it wasn't him. Even though the evidence was overwhelming that her son had murdered her husband, her motherly instincts loved and held on to the son that she believed she had. Christopher Porco was found guilty and given 50 years to life. So thank you for watching my retelling of the classic Christopher Porco case. If you guys knew this story before and you still enjoyed hearing this version of it, please give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe for our weekly videos. And if you know a naked baby, go to happyedition.com directly supports the channel and here is your uh, guess the punchline why did the basketball player scream obscenities when grabbing a rebound mm, have at it <laughs>